this is episode number thirty eight with the assistant coach for the winnipeg jets todd woodcroft who has built up a twenty year career that has taken him all over the world in the field of ice hockey his and nhl resume includes stops in minnesota washington los angeles and calgary before joining the winnipeg jets in two thousand sixteen as an assistant coach welcome todd it's good to see you face to face after all these years for those who don't know, Todd's been a good friend of mine since the late 90s. We actually sat together in teacher training classes at the University of Toronto, and it's been crazy, Todd, to watch your success over the years. Uh, let's get straight to the question so you can get back to work over there. And where are you, by the way? Right now I'm in uh, lovely Raleigh, North Carolina. Just uh, We got here late last night after playing in Chicago, and we have... Uh, a special trip for the players this time. We have all the mothers joining us on a mom's trip for all the players and, and uh, staff members. And uh, tomorrow we play against the Carolina Hurricanes. Very nice. It looks like a lot of fun, but also super busy. So we're going to be sure to get through these questions quick so we can get you back to work. So Todd, where did this all begin for you? I always knew you were into hockey, but can you give a quick overview of how you broke into coaching in the NHL and some of your early influencers, maybe some of the coaches and players you worked with just to give our listeners an overview of your background? I think probably like anything in life, it's about the connections that you have and the network uh, that you're able to create when you're a young person, whether you're starting in the workforce or you're working in sports or you're a student or whatever. And, and I was lucky enough to have played for a guy named Jamie Compton and uh, I had built a hockey school with my two brothers, uh, Jay and Craig in the late nineties. And it was a pretty successful school and, and Jamie and I had kept in touch and Jamie was a uh, coach with the St. Louis blues. And I remember him saying uh, to me, you know, if you ever, want to consider a career like this if I hear something about it I'll let you know and and he ended up calling me in uh in 2000 where I was a hockey director in uh, a place called Davenport Iowa still running the hockey school with my brothers and and he said there's a job open with the Minnesota Wild and and uh if you want a chance to talk to them let me know and and kind of one thing went from another there and and I've been able to have uh 20 years in the NHL and and have had a lot of fun. And I guess to answer your question, the influences coaching wise I've had, I've, I've been the most fortunate guy in the world to have worked with some of the, uh, you know, the masters of coaching. I had Jacques Lemaire. who was considered one of the greatest coaches of all time. I've been with Joel Quenville. Uh, I've coached with Mike Babcock uh, in Hockey Canada. And uh, obviously the, the the biggest influence on me has been lately has been Paul Maurice, who's the head coach of the Winnipeg Jets, who's become, you know, more than a mentor, more than a colleague. He's become a guy that cares about me and is, you know, concerned about my career and has given me so much. So those would be the smartest coaches that I've, I've been around. And there's a lot of other people internationally, but those would be the ones that come to mind. Well, out of all of them, the only guy I know is Mike Babcock coming from yep from Toronto, but um, I'm sure those who follow sports would know who you're talking about. What about some of the players? I definitely don't know players since Daryl Sittler, but <laughs> Yeah, that goes way back and, and growing up in Toronto, I had a number 27 jersey actually, which is uh, always fun for me. I mean, the, it, at the end of the day, ultimately coaches really work for players and we're trying to make them be the best they can be. And, and again, I, I've been, so so lucky starting from you know my minnesota wild days i was able to work with maybe not even household names but people that i was able to get close to whether it was andrew burnett or Dwayne rolls in, in in the wild and going through to the capitals i was there with alex ovechkin his first year and, and Oli kolzig was a goalie and then all the way through to now I, i've been around some pretty good teams internationally a team sweden um was able to have some success with them and, and players like Victor Hedman and the Sedin twins. And, you know, you're in Arizona, so you might know uh, Oliver Ekman Larson is the captain there. I think the best uh, feather for me to have worked with would be ex players in Sweden. And I was able to work with my heroes growing up players. Uh, Matt Sundin, I was able to work with, and uh, Nicholas Lidstrom and uh, Daniel Alfredson, we were kind of all on, a, on a, the staff for the World Cup team in, in, uh, a few years ago. And so those guys have been, been awesome to me. And then even just Hockey Canada, Scott Niedermeyer and 
Patrice Bergeron, who's still playing and is still such a great player, Danny Heatley, Roberto Luongo, all those guys. I, I mean, I could go on and on, and I'm sure none of those guys even remember me, but I certainly remember all them and the fact that they uh, they were able to walk beside me and, and, and win with all those guys that I just mentioned. We won something. So that, to me, is going to be something I'll, I'll take with me for the rest of my life. Well, it's pretty powerful because uh, we, we know we've been influenced by people, so you're definitely having an influence on others. And I know it's easy for those of us when we're watching a game, we can notice when the team is in sync and we can be cheering like, go, go team, everything's working well. How does the identity of a team form to where the players are working in sync like that, like clockwork? And then how does it change throughout your season? I think that's the first part there. And and I'll actually almost go out of hockey, which is really all that I know sport-wise. But I I remember hearing Kobe Bryant say that when you have – you know, five players in a basketball court or in hockey, you have five players and goalies, you really have six. And you have uh, a likening to a musical orchestra where you have people playing different instruments. And if all their instruments are playing in sync, you're going to have outstanding music. And whether you're playing just a certain notes and maybe you hit a couple notes off, but your, your teammates or the people in the orchestra with you, they're able to mask that. So for us, it's a, it's a lot of things going into it. Um, we know that the players really only have a short time in their career. Now, sometimes it stretches out for a year. It might be 10 or 15 years. But as coaches, we want to get, we want to get the best out of them. And I think for us, it's having the players understand that every time that you're on the ice or on the basketball court or on the soccer pitch or whatever sport that you're playing, that a lot of the times nothing is happening. And that's okay. So we say like in hockey that so much of the game, really nothing is happening. And as fans, those are the times when fans are watching the game and say, okay, like what's going on? The puck's changing trajectory, the puck's changing direction, what's happening? There's a face off, there's something going on. But that's okay for us as coaches. And, and that's where we try to implement structure inside their game. And the small part of the game, something happens, it's fun, whether it's like, you know, a fantastic goal that gets scored or outstanding pass or a big body check or whatever it is. No, those are small moments in the game, but we try to control as coaches the larger moments in the game and give the players structure and a foundation that they can always come back to and understand that, hey, I have some experience as a player. Uh, Where do I go when something happens? Where do I go in my experience set when I know that this thing is going to happen? So that's what we're trying to provide for the players as coaches. And then I keep thinking back to the corporate world because, you know, your team, you've got an identity as a team in a corporation, has a culture. How are you keeping their mindsets on the game and that identity and that culture to keep everything working right um, in the locker room, you know, just in and out of the rink? It, it's a daily, daily grind. And it's a grind for us to have the players also understand that it's a grind. So we're in a business where we're ultimately judged by wins and losses. Coaches, that's how we are judged by uh, the players, by the fans, by the owners, by the management, by everybody who watches hockey. It, It doesn't really matter at the pro level as coaches. Hey, are you a good person? Are you good in the community? Are you you know, a nice person with your teammates and the players that are under you, it matters if you win your loss. So that, that for us is something that we have to worry about. We understand that that's a struggle, but we want to target that struggle and, and the grind of getting the players and us as coaches really to be the best that you can be daily. So daily, like I'm an assistant coach, so daily I'm trying to do a triage of all the problems that happen inside of a day. You know, it could be whether someone's not feeling right or someone's upset with their minutes played or, or whatever it is. But we want our players to accept that struggle and to embrace it. And even the idea or the analogy of um, the best athletes are the ones who accept their pain, who accept that struggle. Like for me, it would be like a marathon runner who every day wakes up and all of a sudden, oh, it's, it's raining outside today. I'm not sure that yeah, I, my knees get sore in the rain or, you know, I, I don't have good times in the rain. Um, we feel as coaches, at least with our team, that we want our players to accept that. And every single day, we're reminding them that this is not going to get easier. As our team has gotten better, things do not get easier. They get harder. And if you can get our players in the short window to understand that it is going to be hard, it is going to be difficult, 
and then to do it individually as well as collectively, we feel that we're going to have our players uh, have a lot more success. Well, I guess that's how it works in the corporate world as well, you know, and even thinking about the job of a coach, it reminds me a lot of a job of a president or a CEO, you know, your numbers aren't there and your judged yeah. numbers, you're out, you're fired, you're gone. And that's the reality of your world. You know, how do you deal with that? Well, I think personally I have the best job in the history of jobs. Like this is fantastic. I get to go to work every single day and be around people who all have the same goal. We all have the same goal of, at least in hockey, of winning the Stanley cup. And our job as coaches, you're, it's very similar to the corporate world, whether you have, you know, employees who are working under you or employees who are working above you, um, that there is a shared common goal. And if we can identify what that is at the beginning of every season, and we know we want to win the Stanley Cup, but there are also incremental steps, whether that might be we want to uh, make the playoffs. You know, we want to incorporate into our game certain system things or structural things that will increase various outputs, almost like your corporate. Like, we want to score this many goals. We want to prevent this many goals. We want our power play to be at this position in the hockey, in National Hockey League. We want our penalty kill to be in this position in the NHL. So we will set our goals at the beginning of the year, and then we will actually be unyielding in our message to the players daily. And we usually have four or five things as coaches that we would identify. So it actually usually happens a season previous, like we, when we lost in the playoffs last year, like three, four days later, as a coaching staff, we met and said, what are our messages for next year? What are the specific hockey things we want to have every single day? And no matter what happens, no matter what the weather is on the team, we will always come back to that and say, these are the things that are identifying our team. These are what we will be unyielding on. And, and the players, you know, the actors on the teams, they, they, they come and go just like it would be in any corporate environment. You're going to have people who are in and out and are looking to advance and get more and, you know, maybe have different uh, contributions to your corporate world. It's the same thing in a team. Players always want to have more. And it's our job as coaches to try to facilitate them. And as a player, you might only have a short time to impress, whether that's inside the season or even inside of a game where you might be playing four or five minutes a night rather than playing 20 minutes like the superstars are playing. But it's what you do inside those four or five minutes that will dictate the next day for you and the next week and the next month. So we ask our players to try to take incremental steps to get better. And it might take couple months it might take a couple games it might take a couple years but we want everybody to have success it might not be with our team we might be training them to be better somewhere else and that's what happens a lot inside of hockey but you know for us it's so many times revisiting the messages whether it's just getting over the fear of losing or the fear of not having success and having our players that you're special you're in the NHL and this is a special thing but it's, it doesn't really matter how hard you work to get here. That's great because that's a, the yardstick that's accepted by everybody because the guy underneath you or the player underneath you or the employee underneath you, they also worked hard to get there. Or the employee or the boss or the coworker or teammate above you also worked hard to get there. So while you're special to be here, the team dynamic is usually more important than just the individual dynamic if that makes any kind of sense for you. Yeah, it does. And it, it's surprising to me that it was that fast after you guys lost last year that you started thinking about next year. That's where I see the difference in the corporate world. The end of a corporate year, you don't have training and going over what's next for another few months. You know, you got the summers off. You guys don't have that downtime. You know, no. it's just bam, bam, bam for you guys. It's Don't you get tired? Yeah, I mean, you get tired, but we're also dealing with uh, athletes who are at the peak of their professional life. So these are young, in the NHL, they're young men uh, who are between the ages of 18 and about 35. Mm -hmm. So there is a fatigue aspect, and, and we try to catch our rest when we can. So like for our work environment, we want our players to be as rested as they can. So they will want for nothing. We will give them everything they need, 
but then we expect out of them a return. We expect them to treat their bodies right. We expect them to rest right. We expect them to stay hydrated. We expect them to prepare in the off season so when they report to a training camp that they're ready to go. We will give them every single thing that they need and we will not give them any problems. Like we will have, you need a sleep doctor? Hey, here's a sleep doctor for you. You need a skills person for you? Hey, here's a skills. You need video cut for you and sent to your phone so you can watch it on the plane? No problem. We will give you everything, but then we have high expectations. So um, I think the lessons we learn, and specifically, like you said, Andrea, from last year, like we lost in the first round to the team that ultimately won the Stanley Cup, which was the St. Louis Blues. And the St. Louis Blues were in last place in January of last year. And then they just decided that the teams who will do the most work usually win. And they got uh, a team identity of just outworking everybody all the time. So there are no individuals on their team. Obviously, they have 23 players in their roster and they ice individuals every night, but their ability to play collectively, it's amazing. And, and for me, watching their evolution from being a team that had some, you know, it didn't have the same synchronicity that it has now how they really made up for their weaknesses with an effort, a team effort. And I, I don't know where I heard it, but I remember someone telling me like it, it, effort really trumps everything else. And, and it doesn't take any more than rain or time to really bring down the biggest walls. So if you just keep going and keep going and enduring and keep going, you're going to wear other teams down. So whether that time frame is a long period of time or whether it's a 60 minute hockey game, if you can outwork the other opponents and keep going all the time, then usually you're going to have some success. That's true. That ties back into a lot of the research and education. It's all about effort, the effort you put in, and then you get the results, but you've got to keep trying. Um, I've heard your team be called the best face-off team in the NHL by far, and I know this is your expertise. And with skill building, we actually just had our last episode with Dr. John Denlowski, and he talked about the research behind learning any new skill being spaced repetition of a skill. And I know in athletics, you practice a skill over and over again. But how do you know what skills are important to practice? How do you make these skills priority? And how do you make it not boring for everybody? Those are excellent questions. And those are constant um, issues that we have all the time. And as you're seeing, Specifically in professional sports, you're seeing the athletes are having outside influences. So for us as coaches on a specific team, it's being able to manage what those influences are. So I would liken it to Tiger Woods would have a hitting coach, like, a, like how to hit balls. Like Tiger Woods is one of the greatest golfers in history, one of the greatest athletes in history. But he will have somebody come in and work specifically with him on hitting golf balls or in baseball, you have pitching coaches, you have catching coaches, you have hitting coaches. Again, you have all different kinds of influences on each athlete in hockey. The players have now figured out that their bodies are really their investment in the off season. They will hire specific people to work on individual skills for them. So whether it's skating or whether it's stick handling or whether it's uh, individual skills with a stick and a puck that happens. And the players are getting better at it. So I can tell you right now that I'm not a better skilled player than even one player on our team. Every one of the players on our team has infinite more skills than I do. But where I will spend time is worrying about the small minutia, the details of a game. So you mentioned face-offs, which is something that we have taken pride in in Winnipeg. And when I came there, Paul uh, – asked me to take that over as uh, one of the projects that I have. And we went from near the last place to now we're up around the top, which is great. Um, but for me, the, the thing that was important, how we changed it, was we made it important. So that specific thing you talked about, face-offs, we made it important to our players. We let our players know, so our centermen were the, were the positional players who take face-offs. We let them understand, hey, this is an important thing to us. And so we revisit it every single day. We practice it every single day. We talk about the face-offs before the game. We talk about the face-offs they took after the game. And then we post um, our progress throughout the season for all our centermen to see on a daily thing. So I guess to answer your question in a long roundabout way is that we have made something important. 
We have allowed the players to have a voice and a say in it. We do it collectively where all the centermen will get together and we'll talk about our own skill as a face-off centerman and also against the opponents that we're going to play. What are their tendencies? What are they good at? Hey, what is your experience when you go against this player here? Well, this is my experience. What's your experience? And then we're able to solve problems together. So it kind of goes back to the whole educational uh, aspect of your question there that you can do things individually, but also collectively as well. And where your focus is going and whatever you're focused or you're putting your energy on, that's what is developing, you know, that where your energy goes, your attention and focus flows. So, you know, you've got to be thinking and planning on certain things for them to develop. If you're not thinking of them or working on them, they're definitely not going to improve. Oh, you're, you're a hundred percent right. And, and also understanding that it's a process as well. Right. And, at least for us, we identified the process we want to have on individual skills and, and player skills. And again, we'll just go back to face-offs because that was your question. But we had a process on it, and we knew that we would have to stay with this process to see success. Because for, for us, we understood early that the biggest mistake you can make is to change before you succeed. So we figured out that our process was something we believed in. And it took a little bit of time, but then the success started to uh, show itself. And uh, something I heard Paul Maurice say at one time is that, you know, when you're making a big change, it's kind of like a landscaping. Like when you're going to do some landscaping, you're going to have a messy yard to start. Mm -hmm. But then as your project keeps going on and on, you're going to finally get to what you want to have your landscaping look like or the skill that you're trying to acquire and the skill that you're trying to make better inside your players or your coworkers or teammates or students or whatever. Absolutely. Todd, now you've got a unique background with your training and education, and I'm sure this really helps as a coach. So with this teaching background in mind, can you think about why athletes really embrace practicing a skill? But like if we go into the classroom, students don't like practicing, you know, their math or whatever they for a test, they're going to cram, which is not the best way to study. So if you were to visit a classroom, what advice would you offer teachers or students with your experience with pro athletes on learning new skills and the importance of spaced practice like you do in the NHL? I think there the first thing is that whether it's uh, 23 students or 23 players, uh, they would be best served to understand that it's never personal. So if we're trying to make our players better or our students better or your coworkers or people who work um, beneath you or above you, it's never a personal thing. If you have a shared goal as a group, so either winning or sales or whatever it is, um, you need to work together collectively on it with a common uh, message, with a theme that is identified as a group. With students specifically, I think the challenge there is you're dealing with younger people who haven't yet come to the understanding that there's a greater world outside of just mm -hmm. themselves. And I think now the difference between when you and I were uh, learning educational techniques and philosophies and theories back in the nineties, it wasn't the same as it was now. The dynamics have shifted a little bit now. So there's a little bit more partnership even inside sports between coaches and players, as well as with teachers and students. Mm -hmm. And for me, it comes down to the personal aspect of a connection with a player or the connection with a student. So you will have students who tune you out, tune you out. You will have players who tune you out, but you have to find a way to connect with them. So some sort of a common ground. At the end of the day, players really are students and they all want to get better. And whether they're comfortable in their environment or they're uncomfortable in their environment and they're trying to get better or they just want to stay status quo, the job of a coach or the job of a teacher really is to find uh, the connection with the student or the player that is going to make them succeed. So there's no easy answer for that one. I think it just comes down to uh, the work time that you put into it, the connection that you have with your student and the connection that you have with your players. Definitely. And it's a lot more fun to practice a sport or because you, you know, it's, you got a win or a loss and there's the, the Stanley cup and, if students can't see the end result, it's almost like, well, what is this for? So that it's really difficult to get that motivation when there's not an end goal like you've got. But it, the, the, the elite students 
the elite players in any sport or the elite actors, the elite musicians, the elite carpenters, whatever you are, those are not as common as the regular people, the regular students, the regular athletes. So even inside the NHL where there's about 800 players, there might be like 25 that are the kind of players that you just are blown by your mind. The rest of them are very similar. And for me to see um, one thing about what makes a good player, not the the elite Connor McDavid's and Sidney Crosby's or Wayne Gretzky's or Daryl Siddler's of, of, you know, your youth and my youth. It's the players who understand that what makes a good player or what makes a good student is the ability to do the same thing every single day consistently, no matter how boring. If you want to get better at math, you have to work at your math. If you want to get better at golf, you have to hit balls. If you want to shoot pucks better, you have to shoot 10,000 pucks. It's the way that goes. So the, the outliers, the freaks of nature, like the McDavid's and, you know, the Gretzky's and those play Mary Lemieux, those aren't the normal ones. It's the rest of the herd that we're really trying to get to. And then the special ones are the ones that you can find resources to help them. Wow, that's a, a good answer for that. And I know you've got such a, a broad experience, especially working with international teams. And aside from working in Canada, I know you've worked with and recruited athletes from Russia and Finland and Um, I know that those countries are surpassing the results of the United States academically. And Canada, where we grew up, is always ranking pretty high, top 10 with these studies. But with this in mind, how does this translate into the sports world and what can we learn from these international athletes? I've I've had some real cool experiences overseas. I lived in Sweden. I've been so much in Russia and Finland. And even seeing their school systems, which all three are – different from each other and vastly different from Canada and America. Like Finland is, I believe the number one country in the world for education and schooling. And, you know, they have no homework. They have shorter days. Mm -hmm. The emphasis on being happy on mental health as a student. And it's not just about let's, here's the curriculum. Bang, bang, bang. We're going to give you the same thing that's worked for the last 300 years. It's a constant evolving Uh, curriculum for Finnish students in Sweden one of the coolest things I saw was they had some schools that were outside all day long so even if it's in January their students are outside and Mm -hmm. their bodies are adapting their minds are adapting this different stimuli to get them to learn and different ways of getting students to learn Russia is a whole different situation there but in Russia specifically with athletics they have made a huge push almost the other way towards let's identify the best athletes and give them every resource. So so I'm not sure I agree with the way it's done over there for athletics, but they have so many gold medals. They have so many athletes and so many sports who are fantastic, but I'm more inclined towards the 99% of the students who are going to school or the 99% of young hockey players, young boys and girls playing the game. Um, those countries, at least for me, Finland and Sweden specifically, which I think are fantastic sports models, they also have figured out that it's not about winning. They're not trying to develop NHL players. So if you go to the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation, which I think does a marvelous job, specifically again about hockey, because that's really all I know, but they do a marvelous job on having kids get into the program first fall in love with the sport and the resources are given to any new people who come into Sweden or any young players who they want to get into the game. They, uh, they develop this love for the game at an early age. They don't keep score. They work on individual skills and celebrate uh, the things that a lot of times in North America, we wouldn't celebrate in, inside of the game. And, and, and they will encourage players to make mistakes and understand that, you know, if this is your child and your child is playing, that he or she is going to make so many mistakes playing hockey. But when they get to be an older player, those mistakes are kind of like scars. They're kind of like wounds that they've learned from, and they're able to draw on that experience for when they do end up on an international stage if, if he or she is that lucky to do it. I think sometimes in North America we have too much emphasis on – uh, the result 
the end result, like the this is how the game was scored. We won six nothing. We lost six nothing. Rather than the journey to get there. Do it this way. Exactly. Exactly. And don't make mistakes along the way. Like I, I love that we're coming around to the failing forward model. But yes. Yeah, I think they do. I think they do things pretty well over there. Not that they don't do things uh, well in North America, but I've been able to see how they do things there. Now you're also dealing with smaller countries like in I think Sweden has about nine million people and and uh their hockey playing pool is way, 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 way smaller. But in Sweden specifically, about twelve or fifteen years ago, um and Sweden is a powerhouse in hockey right now. It's like a top two or three country in the world for their success, winning on the international stages, developing and producing players at the highest levels. And about fifteen years ago, they were not like that. They were in the bottom. And they couldn't figure out why they had the lowest amount of players ever to play in the NHL and their teams were losing in every single uh, area. So what they did is they hired a bunch of North American specialists to come over and meet with their, uh, their brain trust. And the specialists came over and these were like NHL big name people that came over and North American hockey uh, icons that came over and, were able to uh, present to the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation. And at the end of it, the Ice Hockey Federation in Sweden said, you know what? We don't agree with what these people are saying. We're going to do it our way. And they went back to the grassroots. They put resources into all over the country. They hired coaching educators who went and worked with the youth coaches and said, this is the model that we want to have. If we're building hockey players, the first thing is going to be fun and love for the game. And then from there, all the small details would filter out. And then now, 15 years later, Sweden's winning gold medals. They're, with, they're producing the highest amount of NHL players ever. They have players coming over and playing in NCAA hockey at the highest rate they've ever had. And it's not just their men's team. Their women's team is doing fantastic too. And their youth program is strong. Finland, which is very similar, smallest number of players of all those countries, and they just keep winning. And they're beating Canada. They're beating USA. They're beating Russia. They're beating Sweden. And they also have a belief in the way that they do things. And it's not just result-oriented. It's the process. So they've identified the process they want to have in Finland. They believe in it. They believed in it from the beginning. And it's paying dividends right now. There's so much we can learn from those countries for sure, Todd. So I could keep asking you a ton of questions, but I know you've got work to do. You're on the road. You're working. And I want to end with any of your final thoughts or anything that you think might be important that we've missed. I know you've got your all-star game coming up this weekend. You know, how, how would you close this up for, you know, thinking about people that are listening, like whether they're a student or educator in the classroom, um, someone in the corporate world or an athlete looking to take their skills to the next level. We can all learn from your experience, the daily grind and mindset of the athletes. What, what are your final thoughts here? I think there that and you just nailed it on the head, Andrea, that it's about embracing that, like about understanding that you're going to take a whole series of hits or failures in your career as a teacher or as a student or as a coach or as a player or as a boss or as an employee or whatever it is. If you're going to have success, you're going to take a whole bunch of hits all over your body. And those are going to create some some wounds and some scars that are going to build experience. But the idea also that if you're on any kind of a team, that you need to take those hits and you need to take those scars for the teammate beside you, the coworker, coworker beside you. Because at the end of the day, the price for success or the price for winning is taking those hits. And at least in hockey, we, we've understand we've understood that for a while. And, and there's a lot of like war analogies. Uh, get thrown around pretty easy and I've been so lucky that I've never had to be in a war and I never will be in a war hopefully and, and I hope all the people I care about never in any kind of wars too but we understand that uh, any kind of success as a team or a group or an organization depends on the people beside you so we talk about it all the time in our team about getting in the trench do you want this person to be in the foxhole with you what kind of person do you want to be as a teammate or co co-worker or boss or any kind of a leader so uh, I think that any way that you can understand that if you embrace that daily grind and it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be uh, a, a pretty 
um, a pretty game for you or a pretty classroom for you all the time. It's going to be a daily grind all the time. Uh, we, you and I have talked about it before, about getting in the mud there and, and understanding that you're going to get dirty, but the end of the rainbow the success for you is worth all of that mud. It's worth all of that grease. It's worth all of the hits that you've taken for the people beside you. It sure is, Todd. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your experience. I've sure learned from you and I, I know our listeners will. I want to wish you all the best as you go through this next last half of your, your season here, making the playoffs and then winning the cup this year. Best of luck, Todd. Thank you very much for having me and good luck to you too. Thanks so much.